Rackley, isn't it? Oh. It's only done 112,000 miles as well, this car. It's practically brand new. How are you? How are you? I'm moving along swiftly because I'm a little bit late because Mrs. Angry has got to go and babysit the grandchildren because my daughter's on jury service. So we've just been sorting stuff out. These are my lovely trimmed hedges. You can't see them really. They've only trimmed the bottom half. But got a very helpful farmer next door who does them for me and uh, and only wants money in return, which is great, you know. <laughs> so I hope you're well. It's a gorgeous day. It's, you know, it's, it's one of the sort of week, week, which is coming into sort of the nicest week or the two nicest week of the entire year. We're in August, traditionally a nice month. September's usually nice. Summer starts pretty late. The jet stream has to move north for the summer to start and it's definitely firmly north. I'm going to pull that down over my eyes because Although you can't see me, that also means that I can't... If I don't have it down there, I can't see the oncoming traffic, which, to be honest with you, is slightly more... So, um, yeah, now look, in my last video, I sort of told you about the macroeconomic background to uh, the situation. There's, uh, you know, there's a few bits going on at the moment. There's riots in the streets. People are protesting against... Uh, uh, the, uh, the rapid increase in the population that's occurred as a result of, uh, uh, well, there's a far far greater number of people who come here legally uh, but, and they put a strain on services and then a small number who come here, a smaller number, still a big number, but a smaller number of people who come here illegally that also put a strain on services and, uh, and the public is, uh, Equally annoyed about both. There we are. We're going to get through, aren't we? Yes. So it's all it's all spilled over. You know, there's been riots in almost every town, I would say, of any size. Not much sign of anything in Wingham so far, but uh, or Canterbury. But uh, certainly, I, I think uh, I don't know some of the the towns that are absorbing a large amount of uh, this uh, new. Um, immigrants. I'd be careful what I say because you know if you're not yeah, YouTube in particular is still very funny about what people say. X is uh, uh, far less uh, censorious since Elon Musk bought X and said it was going to be a bastion of First Amendment right to uh, say what you like even if other people disagree with it. And the, the um, you know, all we've got is this daily diatribe of people on the BBC saying how shocking it is. You know, the Blue Rinse Brigade come on to clutch their pearls and say, oh, everyone should be locked up. Everyone who's, you know, they, they don't ever say why they're rioting. They just say it's violent disorder and they should be locked up without actually trying to understand why uh, there's so much violent disorder everywhere. You know? <laughs> So, um, and then uh, Farage uh, has got a YouTube channel, which I think is far more, <clears throat> how can I put it? It makes more sense. He's, he's far more willing to address the root cause of these problems rather than just uh, shouting that everybody should be locked up and uh, the jail should be full, filled up and then, and then emptied because they're filled and filled up with a load more people. <laughs> I really. This is the problem, this is the problem, and I've said this before, fend the regime, end of the regime, the money is, uh, dictates the end, because the government can't pay for things, the money gets debased, they end up just paying the army and the police, and nobody else, and then the, then the whole thing collapses. Always happens, always happens. Not even an option, you know, not even negotiable. Always happens at the end of any uh, sort of hegemonic uh, phase of power. They debase the currency and they go into a slow motion train crash. So l last time I did say I would like, put, run a few ideas past you with regard to what you can do and what you need to do to <clears throat> protect yourself. 
Now, first of all, let's just agree that you can protect yourself. If you think this is one of those things where, you know, it's uh, the end of the world is nigh and there's nothing you can do, you know, if you're, a, if you're like got a Jehovah's Witness approach to uh, the world that, <clears throat> and there's nothing you can do, you're, you're just a tiny cog in the big machine and if, the, you know, and if, if everything burns and you're going to burn with it, then really, obviously, then I can't help you. There's no help for you there. So, if you're uh, more of a uh, sort of a idea that uh, some that you know that you can, if you're tuned in, if you've got the right model in your head, if you've got if you're thinking the right way about stuff, that you can at least mitigate the uh, problem and end up relatively better off compared to everyone else who's just walking straight into this fat, dumb, and happy. Then. Uh, you know, then there may be hope for you. If you think that, you know, you're uh, going to fully position yourself to come out of this as, as one of the richest people in the world, because you understand the situation so well, and you're so well positioned that it, it's going to mean a material transfer of wealth from other people to you, then, oh, I mean, you know, I know there are people like that. There are certainly lots of people that will sell you that idea. Um, but, uh, you know, that's altogether far more challenging and I would say a matter of luck to some degree. So, also I'm going to hedge this by saying that, you know, I am not giving you any advice, legal advice, investment advice or anything. You shouldn't listen to what I say, I'm an idiot, don't sue me. Uh, I'm not charging you anything for this, so you can't there's no damage because you're not paying anything if you do anything as a result of what I say then it has to be as a result of you independently coming to the same conclusion as me you know by listening to a variety of sources and uh, you know possibly possibly <laughs> engaging a paid investment advisor although I don't myself do that because I don't think they're honestly worth five pence the advice they give uh, the advice that they give is far more geared towards getting their children through private school and uh, allowing them to buy that £90,000 Volvo that they've always wanted than it is. And I had an odd situation where I went, uh, it was a very sad family circumstance, a funeral, and uh, we spent a night in uh, Cornwall in a hotel and uh, my brother-in-law Who's, who's a wealthy individual, you know, he's got a, he's got a Porsche, he's got a Ferrari, he's got a hotel and a boat, four million pound boat and all that, and, and so, so a very wealthy individual. And uh, also at this uh, funeral was his investment advisor. He's an independent financial advisor or whatever. Now, now I find that very strange. And I don't, you know, and I've seen, I mean, I had, we, we did a podcast, uh, myself, Chris Ritchie, and Richard Lishman, who is a, a financial advisor, and I've had a chance to sort of look at the way these people work, and getting to be your friend is the ultimate from their point of view. If they can get you to in, invite them to your wedding, or your daughter's wedding or something, then they, they know they've got their hooks in well and truly into you. And uh, <clears throat> I had a chap, the chap who sorted my mortgage out, I remember. This must have been 1982, 1983. And uh, we uh, used to like drinking Carlsberg Special Brew. And the reason for that was because we used to see the tramps drinking it on the benches. And it always struck me as a bit esoteric. No, I'm going to leave the camera where it is now. I've got the steering wheel in it, I didn't want it. Anyway. Perhaps I'll, I'll crop it out. Anyway, it was, it was an incongruous thing. You've got a tramp there, you know, wearing three overcoats, who's sleeping on bench. In those days in London, you could just sleep on a bar bench. And uh, was wrapped up in uh, newspaper stuff inside his clothes to keep himself warm. Stank to high heaven. And he's drinking the most expensive lager you can buy. 
So uh, it was either that or cider. Cider actually was um, uh, slightly uh, stronger and, and cheaper because the tax on uh, the revenue tax on cider was less than it was on beer, and so actually cider was was you know the in terms of alcohol for your buck the preferred drink they didn't want to drink out of a bottle of book or anything so cider but by, by a special brew so anyway i thought well look, why i'm not going to do the economic analysis on this these blokes are sitting around all day they got plenty of time to do the economic analysis if carlsberg special brew is the best beer in terms of getting drunk for the what you spend then that's the drink for me so I always drank Carlsberg Special Brew. And because I just graduated as a dentist, I used to buy in a tray 12 large cans at a time. But of course we had nowhere to put it because where do you, you know, most uh, kitchens in rented accommodation don't have beer storage cupboards. So we just used to keep it underneath one of the dining room tables. Anyway, this chap came round and uh, uh, you know, we done a, uh, we had a chat, and then I said to him, "Can I offer you a drink?" And he said to me, uh, "He said, I know. He said, I know it's a long shot. He says, but you don't happen to have any Carlsberg Special Brew, do you?" And I was like, because I was, I was young and naive, uh, I said to him, "Do you know what? But you've actually picked the one thing I think we have got." <coughs> so I gave him a can of Special Brew. And he sort of pretended to drink it, and we were best mates after that. So, and then it was only, <laughs> this is how stupid I am, it was only years later that I, I was, I used to, I thought, because it's a coincidence, and I thought, of all, all the times in my life where they had like a massive coincidence, like I went on my honeymoon, bumped into my geography teacher in, uh, in Kenya, for example. I mean, that was a coincidence. But, and this was also like just this massive coincidence that he wanted the exact, the only drink, the only drink I really had. And then I was like, there was a complete face palm moment when I thought, <laughs> of course he did, of course he did, because he'd seen it. He knew, he'd seen it under the table. So that's why he asked for it. And he didn't want to drink it at all. And he probably never drunk it before or since. But because he wanted to ingratiate himself with me, he decided to ask me for, for the drink that he knew I'd got and he knew that I probably obviously liked. Anyway, having said that, he was quite a good guy and got me a mortgage with Chemical Bank in America, which was extremely cheap at the time, uh, but, but which I had to give up when I moved. But um, this is, my point is that, you know, the, the independent financial advisors, their only uh, means that they're independent of uh, at one particular firm. They're not linked to any one particular firm. That doesn't necessarily mean that they are independent of uh, their desire to make as much money out of you as they possibly can. And at the end of the day, this is what independent financial advice, this is why you go into that profession. What you do is you'd like to make interest or profit on money and it's been much nicer if it was somebody else's money. So for example, you know, you, I, I've got a few grid under management, my own management, my own money, but I'd much prefer it if I had like, say, 100 million pounds under management, or two billion pounds under management, and that's what an independent financialer does. They take 1% or 2% of all the money that they can get under management, which is your money. So, <clears throat> now having said that, <coughs> excuse me, if you're too lazy or too dumb to uh, actually work out what's going on or or think you are you're probably not but think you might think you are and then and you want someone else to do all the hard work and do all the um god do you think he's towing enough stuff that bloke then uh, then you know you might think well I'll get an independent financial advisor and that's like and I'll just subcontract the job and that's fine you know I mean it, you know you can subcontract anything can't you you can you can subcontract having children to your next door neighbor if you want to but 
my advice is that think carefully before you do it, that's all. Because, um, you know, the sort of people that do subcontract this job, for example, I mean, let's say my brother-in-law's worth, I don't know, two million, could be five million, could be 10, I don't know, say five. And then um, inflation's been like, uh, let's say 10 or probably approaching 20% over the last three or four years. And so the purchasing power of that five million pounds, which I'll warrant is invested in cash and cash instruments, has decreased. Uh, and yet he's probably being told by his financial advisor that the amount of money he's got is going up. So which is, and the, the way that happens is that you, for example, you can get two or three percent interest and so the actual amount of pounds goes up, but because each pound individually buys less, the purchasing power of the, of the total fund goes down more, more than it's gone up. And you can slip that sort of thing by the average, uh, the average punter who doesn't know much about maths. And they used to slip that past the BD, the BDA, who I, I was on the um, Benevolent Fund Management Committee for a while. And they had a load of CDOs, collateral, collateralized debt objects. And uh, I went along to a meeting. I think it was, I don't know, it wasn't with Coots. I was in one of the, one of the top private banks, anyway, where the Ben funds got their funds. And they just go along, and uh, you know, and someone, someone who's some sort of flimflam man, comes out and, <laughs> and says, "Oh, yeah, sure, investments have done." Uh, very well uh, last year. Not probably as good as the market, but but still quite well. They don't mention that we've had like a hundred thousand pounds off you in fees, and uh, for buying and selling stuff, or by more likely selling stuff and then buying it back. Uh, and uh, you know this is how your investments break down, and uh, they showed us the breakdown of the investments. Some of these things, CDOs, and CDOs are, were. <clears throat> were toxic at the time and uh, they just uh, you know this is post 2008 I think I think yeah I think I think it was my, my, my memory might be not right on that but anyway but it was known at the time if you ever watch the movie the big short that they'll explain to you what CDOs are and why they're not a good idea anyway it seemed to me that the BDA benevolent fund owned a, a load of these and uh, the bank weren't all that keen to explain to, to them a that they owned a load of them or b even what they were so and the and the bda uh, council you know the the ben, the ben fund board they're, they're like oh look there's a private bank oh look at all that dark wood oh doesn't it smell of biggest wax polish in here oh what a lovely place you know and that that boy he's posh isn't he he's got a, such a fantastic posh or oh, if he says if he's how do you do to me i must remember to say how do you do back and not very well thank you <laughs> you know and they're so they're so <laughs> like craven toadying away that they don't actually realize that their investments are probably probably not you know i mean i suppose by definition they are what they want because that's what they want but then you know i mean how am i going to explain to the bda benevolent fund board speaking as an outsider which you always are and i was because i was i was on it from the gdpa uh, you know that <clears throat> that what a collateralized debt objective uh, object is. I just uh, it's not going to happen, is it? And so and that's how the financial industry bamboozles us and and preys on us. To be quite honest, you know they see us as a cash cow. A lot of people see dentists as a cash cow, uh, but the financial industry is is one of them. Anyway, look, I'm nearly at work now and I was going to tell you how to avoid suffering in a financial crisis, wasn't I? So I'll set the I'll set the ground rules for it anyway, okay? So like I say, you're I'm not I'm not trying to keep it in suspense. It's just that uh, you know, you have to do all this caveat emptor and small print stuff because legally some idiot, you know, might say, well, I followed angry slavishly and I did what he said exactly or my interpretation of what he said and and as a result I've lost a ton of money if you think that you can't you know if you're 
not competent enough to manage your own money, you certainly shouldn't be listening to me. Well, you can listen to me, but just don't blame me. If you do something stupid, and it all goes tits up. Right. Well, I've done really well there. The school's out, you see. When we go through the school, you'll see the playground's all empty. So, and that means that the traffic is much lighter. I always drive down the middle of the road because they, they've got these really deep manhole covers. And I don't know why people, by our choice, with no other car on the road, choose to drive down and up these things. It's like speed bumps, isn't it? If you can get round a speed bump, you, you should. Don't have to subject the local people to all your screeching of your brakes and all the asbestos off your brake pads. <clears throat> and all the, the tyre dust off your tyres. And the sound of your car accelerating again from the, from the speed bump, if you can just drive round it. <coughs> right, here we are. So what I'll do, I'll go, I'll put some thoughts together on um, protecting your wealth. Okay. Soon. I'll do it. I will do it soon. Okay. All right. Okay. Nice to talk to you. Bye.